On behalf of the International Committee of the Red Cross, and as Director of International Law and Policy, I am delighted to be able to address you today and would like to sincerely thank and congratulate the organisers of the Digital St. Petersburg International Legal Forum. It's an important time in human history that we come together. And despite the fact that we're dealing with a global crisis, a crisis that is a pandemic, that does not respect jurisdictional boundaries, doesn't respect rules and regulations, there is still a lot of international law we need to work together as a global community and push forward. Obviously, this session is on international human rights law, but the law of war, international humanitarian law, the area that we as the ICRC have a particular mandate to focus upon is still very relevant. And today in my short intervention, I wanted to flag a few concerns that we are having and issues that we need to engage on and also direct you to a very useful two page handout relating to the laws of war and COVID. But to start with, I think it's important to flag that for those who are experiencing this situation and already were in a war torn country, or a country that, where there was significant violence, the stakes are very high. We know that in places where the health system has already been under pressure, where hospitals have been bombed, where fresh water is difficult to access in the best of times, the challenges and the vulnerabilities that we face today in dealing with the pandemic are even more critical. So my first point is that we must not forget that sadly, situations were extremely vulnerable before this crisis, and we need to make sure that we continue to ensure the protection and dignity of those people in such situations. Now, the Red Cross and Red Crescent movement has a wealth of experience in dealing with how to help communities and societies be more prepared and more resilient. And I know that, for example, the experiences that we have had in places such as Africa, dealing with the Ebola pandemic, are things that we need to globally learn together. It is critical, not just in the legal framework, but in the operational framework that we share in the current time, learnings and areas to make sure that we don't forget the most vulnerable. Now, some of the key areas of concern for the ICRC relate to areas that we were working in. For example, we fear for the worst for people who are in prisons or displacement camps around the world. In those areas, we know, as the ICRC, that clean water is often a luxury, soap is unattainable, and physical distancing can be a real privilege, simply not available to people in these places. So the implementation of basic infection prevention and control measures can be challenging when there are scarce resources. The second group of people we are worried about are those who have been displaced by conflict or who may be already experiencing health complications. Temporary accommodation or camps can be crowded with inadequate health and sanitation facilities. So we need to ensure that these people get the access to clean water that they need. And finally, I wanted to flag the concern that the ICRC has for people who are in detention facilities. These are often overcrowded and in the first place lacked hygiene and had poor ventilation. And these pose extra challenges when trying to prevent or contain the spread of disease. Now, for example, the situation in northeast Syria with the Ahol camp gives great concerns to us. We know that there are over 10,000 foreign nationals who are currently trapped in that camp, many of them children and women, and including a number of Russians. Now, they do not have the opportunity or the chance to return to their countries without the assistance of respective governments. Now, the ICRC and the Red Cross and Red Crescent Movement works hard to improve the living conditions for those people to the level possible. 
but we cannot bring them back to their countries without the active involvement of states. And with the current global attention on COVID-19, as it should be, we should not forget about this group of people. Now, to date, I'm happy to say Russia has already given a number of very positive examples in this regard, and we looked forward to continuing to work with the Ombudswoman in this area. Pandemics, as we know, cannot be won by one or two countries. They need a global effort, and we need to make sure we don't forget those who are living in places such as the Ahol camp. So we hope that we can continue to work very productively with countries such as Russia to make sure that we respond appropriately at this time to the needs of those who are detained in such camps. The second area I wanted to flag relates to all the normative legal framework around humanitarian exemptions. Now we in the ICRC work in places, be they war zones or post-war zones, that others don't go and often are the only institution in that space. And one of our requirements is that we work in an impartial manner, just as it does in situations such as the pandemic and in conflicts, it makes no sense and has no legal framework to work just for one side and not for the other. And as I stated at the start, illnesses do not respect borders. So it is very important that there is the adoption of domestic legislation and frameworks to allow so-called humanitarian exemptions. Now we know that the Security Council, pursuant to Resolution 2462, identified the need for humanitarians working strictly impartially based on needs of the people they assist alone, created that resolution and we know that many countries supported it, including Russia. And what we need to see today is that those exemptions and protections for humanitarian workers are embedded in domestic legislation. And I do know that my colleagues in Moscow are very keen to engage in a dialogue to move this forward. And globally, I'm working with many colleagues in capitals to make sure at this critical time, humanitarians can do their job. Thirdly, I wanted to make, spend a moment looking at the issues around the Red Cross emblem. Now, working in situations of armed conflict, the ICRC does not carry weapons. Our only protection is our logo, which includes the protective emblem of the Red Cross on the white background. And what we need globally, and specifically at this time, to be able to address the crisis is domestic legislation to protect the Red Cross emblem. And I know, again, my colleagues have been working very hard and productively with the Russian authorities to move this protection of the Red Cross emblem forward and we stand ready today to continue this work. So some key issues around the obligations of detention, situations of humanitarian exemptions and the protection of the Red Cross emblem are some of the messages I wanted to highlight today. And finally, I wanted to, uh, to present and flag this very informative two-page document that deals with COVID-19 and international humanitarian law. I will make sure that we have it available for the participants in this important forum because it deals with medical personnel, facilities and transport and all the regulations and articles pertaining to their protection. It deals with the issue of water, a critical issue at the moment and an area that needs to be protected and is protected under the current legal framework. It deals with the issue of humanitarian relief, with persons specifically at risk, with detainees, internally displaced persons, children and education, and sanctions regime and restrictive measures. So it provides a written output of some of the issues that I've raised with you today. Thank you again for the opportunity to engage. I very much look forward to hearing how the full discussions went over the next few days. And once again, I wish everyone good health, safety and productive discussions. Thank you.